journey is never about getting to the end. The journey is that, you know, the, the joy of these journeys is the experience itself as you're on them, right? When you get to the end, it's almost the end of of the fun and you almost feel this almost sense of, of loss. You're suddenly, you've been moving, you know, 10 hours a day and, and uh, you know, looking for camp spots and running whitewater and, and seeing all these amazing, you know, animals and having all these uh, amazing experiences with another person or, or, or two other people. Um, and then that suddenly stops and you're back in almost the the ease of civilization which is almost uh it's almost uh, a burden you know and so it's a, it's just that kind of simple way of living and discovery um and that's why i never go i always go to a new journey because i'm looking for that newness that immediateness of experience that you can't really find anywhere else it's a very addictive way to live so ladies and gentlemen i'm here with mr frank wolf i became aware of frank with this video of the polar bear attempting to eat your canoe. Mm -hmm. But then as I went a little bit deeper in a YouTube channel, it, I realized this wasn't just a one-off thing that you're frequently up in polar bear country and frequently in a canoe. Right, yeah. So it, it, I thought it'd be a really good uh, guest for the podcast and you know, talk about some of your adventures, how you managed to pull them off. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the most recent one that you've been on, you ended up, is that where the bear tried to eat your canoe? That's right, yeah. So uh, myself and a friend in uh, basically middle of July uh, set out from Sandy Bay, Saskatchewan, just uh, west of the uh, Manitoba border. And then, yeah, worked our way along the Churchill, up through Eden Lake, Barrington River to the source of the Seal River, South Seal River into the Seal, and then to Hudson Bay. So that was like about just under 1,100 kilometer uh, canoe trip we did in 25 days, uh, and that finished in, in mid-August. So okay. that was the most recent one. Um, and then before that, a, a few weeks before that, I did a, like a thousand kilometer sea kayak journey uh, from Squamish up to Prince Rupert, basically the whole BC coast. So, okay. mm -hmm. so that's all saltwater, obviously. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Saltwater, sea kayak. Uh, uh, and that, that trip was in terms of that was in the, in the kind of the height of the COVID uh, people being very paranoid about, you know, leaving their homes or being told to stay home and this sort of thing. Stay home, stay safe. Stay home, stay safe. And and I'm sure a lot of people who do, you know, journeys or had travel plans at that time, they, uh, you know, everything just went out the window mm -hmm. for a lot of people because suddenly you couldn't travel, um, you couldn't leave the country. Um, and so things were scuttled at the time. Uh, myself and two friends had actually been planning to do a 400 kilometer ski journey um, around from Greece Fjord out along the peninsula um, on Ellesmere, looking at something called That's the, the North Way up north. Yeah, way up north on Ellesmere Island, kind of right across from Greenland and doing kind of a citizen science kind of um, feature for Explore magazine, which Canadian Geographic had funded us with. But then, boom, Nunavut, of course, shut their borders. They're still mm. shut to uh, outside uh, uh, outsiders who are not residents. And then so suddenly we had to scramble to see okay we have the time and we're not just gonna sit at home and twiddle our thumbs um there's always something you can do and, and if you're in the to. bush you're isolated exactly and we <laughs> live are. yeah and they live here it was the ocean of course this is bc you know you could paddle from here to alaska and so myself and uh one of my buddies who was going to the Ellesmere trip we wanted to do, we said, let's just leave from here and go up to up to Prince Rupert. Right. And then he bailed on me a week later um, because his business was collapsing and he had to deal with all the ramifications of that. Yeah. Uh, and so I was on my own. But I like to travel with at least one other person. I, th I think it's a storyteller when you have someone to kind of interact uh, with. Or if you're f photographing, it's a lot better to have a second kayak as well um, if you're photographing and filming. Um, I just enjoy the interaction of having another person with you. You kind of move and motivate each other too. So eventually, we have to turn this into a death match of solo travel versus exactly, uh, exactly. partner travel. Yeah, yeah. So and and there's 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 benefits to both for sure. Um, I oh think come on, yeah. we can't agree with each other here. It's yeah. good, but I said death match. <laughs> exact match. Be it resolved that no. okay. Be it resolved that it's better to have a paddling partner when you're going on an expedition. I mean, you're going to win this one. Yeah, as because, long as you get along, of course, yeah. right? So, yeah, uh, the one the good thing about traveling solo is uh, hopefully you get along with yourself, yes. and then and and that's it's a completely different kind of you know zen zen state, right? When you're out there by yourself, uh, like here in in North Vancouver, I do a lot of mountain biking, and that's mostly 95 percent by mm -hmm. myself, where I go trail running, and it's very you kind of get into it's kind of you can really you know there's there's no distraction, you can kind of really you know uh, get into that kind of you know. Uh, current kind of state of mind, very present state of mind when you're when you're on your own too. 
Um, but with someone else, you definitely, you know, ideas will, will go in, in different ways and, and you can kind of, you know, I, I like the way you can work together with other people. So, uh, yeah, a buddy of mine, who's a great kayaking friend, he came on board for this journey, uh, a Brit with a dry sense of humor. We left from Squamish and then 27 days later showed up in Prince Rupert and we probably saw the BC coast, this beautiful BC coast, almost like, uh, even, even pre-indigenous times because, there was no one on the, there was no indigenous yeah. folks out there, uh, in, in the, um, uh, on the waters. They were staying in their communities. They didn't want people coming into their communities. There was no, no cruise ships, no boat traffic. And so we saw the BC coast almost in this almost like pre human time in a way, which is mm. kind of a unique experience. It was actually really a fabulous place to spend, you know, 27 days, um, kind of on this wild west coast, wild, very quiet west coast and kind of, uh, uh, immerse yourself in that. It was almost like a, a privilege to be there yeah. in that in that time. So it, 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 it's in some ways the the COVID kind of almost directed us away from Ellesmere and gifted us this spectacular you know view of our coast that we'll probably never see again. Right? Yeah. So yeah. So have you ever had? You've obviously done a lot of traveling with people, as have I. I mm-hmm. mean, it, it's it's a false dichotomy to yeah. say that you're pro traveling with other people and I'm pro traveling by myself. Yeah. I really enjoy both. But I have had incidents where I just definitely picked the wrong partner of for the trip. Yeah, yeah. And that's even somebody you've gone with before and everything worked out. Mm-hmm. And then you go again and you they're in a different space psychologically or the demands of the trip are somewhat different and they just completely crumble. So I'm assuming you've had bad experiences going with people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I I, I wrote a book that came out about a year and a half ago called Lines on a Map and and Probably the first the first journey that I ever did that really got me into this long distance you know travel in the wilderness you know by canoe kayak or bike or whatever. Uh, 1995, myself and another uh, person, we became the first to canoe across Canada in a single paddling season. So we left from the Bay of Fundy um, in Saint oh, John. Oh, all the way. Yeah, Bay of Fundy, and then we ended up in Vancouver 171 days later. Um, and the person going, that, going against the wind. Yeah, kind of going the most the traditional voyageur route in the sense that we went up, you know, five and a half weeks up the Saskatchewan and North Saskatchewan River. Um, we went up the St. John River, um, but then across, you know, the Great Lakes and uh, and uh, then down the Fraser at the end was kind of the key key component um, versus having to go up the Fraser. So yeah, that was a route. But the, the person that I went with, I'd only met him. I only met him once before that journey. He'd kind wow. of organized it, and and me having been a canoe tripper in the summers, that was kind of my my summer job, canoe tripping and tree planting, as as a lot of university students in Ontario do. Um, and he basically contacted me out of the blue. He'd fallen out with someone else who was going to do it with him, and then he, always a good sign. Yeah, he and then so I didn't. Really, and for me, I was like, well, even if I'm even if I'm in a canoe with, say, you know, Adolf Hitler, as long as we're moving forward, my attitude was, I just wanted to go across Canada by canoe, and I. I you know, I can manage this. And he ended up not being, you know, the, the greatest uh, canoe partner. But one thing he basically, he basically told me this when I first met him, the first time it was two weeks before the journey. And, and he, um, you know, he was, he was living in this wealthy affluent area of Toronto called outside of Toronto called Oakville. And so I went to meet him just at least once mm-hmm. before we head off on this, you know, <laughs> six month journey together, right? And we'd planned it kind of over the phone. I was in Vancouver, he was in, in Ontario, so kind of doing it remotely. Uh, this is all pre internet, pre Google. You couldn't really check up on people and that sort of thing, right? So, uh, but he basically, uh, I remember him opening the door and he was like just a really good kind of first impression, like six foot four, kind of, you know, kind of a nice, you know, lantern jaw, like, you know, piercing blue eyes, hawk nose, kind of a de- had this big mane of kind of Fabio hair right down to his butt. And, and he basically, you know, uh, first thing he goes, he goes, he goes, Hey, let's go for a walk. I said, all right, let's go for a walk. So a little walk and talk down this, you know, beautiful tree lined street full of mansions. And probably within about say two minutes of me meeting him, he goes into this, this, uh, this, this story about this bear, this basically grizzly bear. Uh, he'd been tree planting himself a couple of years earlier in an area called Swan Hills, Alberta, uh, which according to him was like the highest density of grizzly bears in, um, in, in all of uh, Canada. 
Uh, and so they had, because of that, they had a shotgun at every cache. So usually tree planters, they'll, mm. they'll fill up their tree bags and they'll, uh, they'll fill, they'll fill them up with the trees and there's a cache there in case there was a problem with the bear, you would have some way to defend yourself. And so he also sets up the story that he, he used to tree plant with a couple of, uh, dogs, like a, a pit bull and kind of this, you know, this kind of German shepherd wolf kind of breed. And he also used to plant, you know, talking about solo or, 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 or planting with partners. He planted with another partner who was a woman and a uh, very distinct name. Her name was Everest. And so him and Everest would often plant and work the land together. So he describes a story to me, like right away gets into this story and, um, you know, he says they get dropped off him Everest on this big plot of land where they're going to plant the trees in there. And uh, he kind of he kind of talk. He was a he was a, he was a smoker, and so he would accentuate his story. He had like a Demarier lit kind of smoking like this, and he did have these long dramatic pauses where he'd kind of uh, you know take a big inhale and kind of exhale with like a thousand yard stare. And so he said, so as he's talking to me on this tree line street, he's he's going, um, I killed her yeah. and I ate her. He goes, he goes, he goes. When the dogs were acting squirrely that day, kind of like in the Clint Eastwood kind of way, right? And uh, and so I said, "Oh, here we go." And so, anyways, Everest goes to the far end of land to start planting, and he's at the other end, and you know, planting for about an hour. And all of a sudden, his dogs just start going crazy, and they start sprinting towards the other end of the land. He kind of looks up from his planting, and he sees that there's um, Everest at the far end. She's hunched over. She's got a Walkman on, so she can't uh, like earbuds on, so she can't hear what's going on behind, uh, around her. And he sees on one side of the, the slash pile out come a couple of bear cubs. And then on the other side, the slash pile opposite her, out comes a big mama grizzly. And so she's between, as he says, the grizzly and her cubs. And then... The very, very worst the very position first, you And so the in. dogs are seeing the bear and they're going hard for it. But before the dogs can get there, mama charges Everest. She doesn't know it's coming. Boom, ragdolls her like 15 feet. But before she can kind of deliver the coup de gras to, to the, the poor young woman... Um, in come the two dogs and they're barking and yapping and, you know, the bears, you know, backing off from the dogs. So, so, uh, so Lance, um, this guy, Lance Weathers, he, uh, he drops his planting bag, sprints back to the cache, comes back with the shotgun, you know, pumps the shotgun, um, and he fires the gun in the air, boom. And then he stopped in the street there, gave this kind of, and he goes, and then I had that bears. <sighs> undivided attention and so now mama bear turns and she sees the guy with the gun she starts sprinting at lance and so as the bear comes closer he's kind of got the gun he pops it again bear comes within 50 feet boom clips the bear you know doesn't kill it though bear goes up in its hind legs he pumps it again boom puts one in the bear's chest the bear goes down he walks over slowly and then puts the gun once more to the bear's head finishes off the bear and so in the aftermath of this whole thing is that um, basically Everest ended up being okay. Three broken ribs, a broken wrist, you know, no big deal. Uh, the bear, the MNR, Ministry of Natural Resources, came out and weighed this bear. Apparently it was 1,000 pounds, the largest female sow they'd ever weighed. The two bear cubs got sent to a sanctuary. So I heard this whole story from him right away. So I said, wow, I am going out there with like a wild man on this amazing trip. And this is all, mm -hmm. all word of mouth. I couldn't check this or anything. But then... As you're on a journey with someone for six months, you know, their actions always speak louder than their words. And, you know, we didn't get along very well. Um, probably th at three months in, we basically stopped talking. So three months of almost oh, silence no. in the canoe. Uh, we were in, in, in a 17 foot canoe, 10 feet apart from each other, but we might as well have been on two different planets, right? So we were just kind of, and I, I, my attitude was, I'm just moving forward. How can you make decisions? Care. Like, do we paddle today? Do we not? Do we go out in the rain? Do we go, sorry, you, do we go out in the storm? Do we not? We, we never ever took a day off. Uh, we just went through everything. So 12-hour days, just going all day, moving, moving, moving. But there's still decisions to be so, made. Do we run these rapids on the left or oh, yeah. the right? In terms of that very, I guess, in terms of very curt, you know, hmm. practical things like that, they were still going on. But in terms of any kind of interpersonal desire to kind of, you know, speak beyond the most basic hmm. forms of, of grunting, so to speak. <laughs> no. Uh, um, that was no. kind of it. So, and then we get to the end of this journey, you know, we get to the end. Um, and then he, he basically, me at the time being a poor student, him being a man of, 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 of some means, he basically threw out a, a, uh, a document put together by his lawyer saying that I could not do anything, everything on the trip, be it film, photography, writing, book, anything like that, 
belong to him and if I try to do it without him um, or not give him all the profits of it then he would just sue the pants off me and you know he didn't have a leg to stand on legally but you can't stop someone from suing you and getting mm -hmm. into legal you know skirmish so I just kind of you know right then I was like wow this guy is dead to me you know it, as if he hadn't been three months earlier and I just kind of walked away from it and just didn't uh, didn't pursue it any further so through that whole thing, you know, you know, we still got to the end and without him, I wouldn't have been there. But the, the, I definitely, after that, I knew the kind of partner that I wanted to have, but the whole kind of twist on this story, which is one of the stories in, in my book, um, lines on a map is that three months after the journey ended, I was actually just over here about uh, half a kilometer away. It's a little pub called the Raven, mm -hmm. a Raven pub. And I was there to meet a friend of mine who was a ski patroller up at Cyprus here. And he came with another fellow patroller to meet me for a couple of beers so I'm sitting there at the table he comes in it's and my friend Kevin's there and he introduces me to his fellow patroller and it's a it's a beautiful uh, blonde girl and her name is Everest oh wow in the flesh and so I go wow this cannot be a coincidence and I kind of just make sure this was the right person I kind of said did you did you uh did you ever plant in Swan Hills Alberta she goes yeah planted in Swan Hills Alberta it's a tree planter you ever know a guy named uh, you know Lance Weathers and she goes she had to pause for a second. She said, yeah, 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 I know Lance. Just as if kind of like she had to reach for that. And then I go, well, how are you after the bear attack? And she goes, bear attack? Oh, no. <laughs> and so so the real story from the horse's, proverbial horse's mouth of Everest is that uh, she knew Lance was in the camp but was not a friend of hers. She planted but with another guy all the time. And the only, only thing, a bear incident she ever had is that, you know, a mother and two cubs came onto their land her and her friend saw the cubs went both of them went back together to get to the gun they came back um and the bears were gone and of course they went back and hey we saw two bears and the cub on land and that was it and so of course lance would have heard that through the buzz of the camp and then he concocted this fantasy hero rescue <laughs> scenario and then i had to reflect on anything he told me in the six months in the canoe and i had to say if, if, if his seminal life story yeah. was completely false did did anything he tell me was anything you know the truth and then uh, see I was feeling really yeah, bad about making exactly. that and then he killed her and ate her joke it's like oh no she actually does die in this yes, story like, exactly I'm gonna have to edit this out of the podcast <laughs> yeah. so people can look at me like I'm an asshole yeah but so after having spent six months with him it really it really taught me how to vet how do you vet and how do you vet I, I, I basically like for most of my my partners for the last like twenty years since then since I've been living out here. Uh, most of them aren't even canoeists, but they're people that I, I, I've done stuff in the mountains with skiers, you know, uh, uh, runners, mountaineers, climbers. And I think if you're comfortable in this kind of mountain environment, it, it's really well adaptable to say canoeing and that sort of thing. Um, you know, whitewater kayakers as well. People I've whitewater paddle with and done a lot of that sort of thing. So people, people who, who are comfortable in kind of the, you know, the wild waters and mountains of BC and I've spent time with them and I'm really comfortable and compatible with them and they, and they have kind of a very, almost like an easygoing disposition where things kind of slide off their back. They're not, you know, you can't be too high strung, I don't think, on these trips. You really have to kind of take it as it comes, take what the land gives you, take what the weather gives you, the wind gives you. So a person like that, that you have spent some time and has that kind of, you know, um, easygoing, you know, rapport and, and, and nature with you and, and with the land around them, that's the kind of person that I look for, which is very much the opposite of what of what uh, Lance was on that time. So, and it's worked out great. Like I'd say I haven't really had really a bad partner since um, after this initial six month uh, uh, kind of- After a uh, minor six month yeah, journey exactly. across, <laughs> a, how, many how many miles was that? How many kilometers? It was about almost 8,000 kilometers mm -hmm. on the route we took. So, um, yeah, so that was the first single season coast to coast. That was our goal, which we did. And then uh, and then that just so kind of kicked it Berlin off for me. Kruger never did that back in the day? There was, so for the people who don't know, <coughs> Berlin Kruger was this old guy who looks like, I don't know, a, a ship's captain. Right, right. Who paddled something like 100,000 kilometers in his lifetime. He right, basically, yeah. North America, east to west, west to east, north to south, all the way to the bottom of Argentina. Like it, it's, it's yeah, just... he didn't do that route across like coast to coast there in a year. Yeah, in in a single season, and um, I know people had done it before in like two seasons, mm. and so our goal was just to push it in a single season and do it kind of coast to coast. 
Um, yeah, so we were, and people have done it since then, of course, yeah. but uh, we just happen to be the. You're the, like the four minute mile. Yeah, Watch it exactly. Proof and, of concept. Yeah, exactly. And, now, and, now, and there's, there's, there's different ways and routes and stuff to do it. Um, but um, yeah, and after that, that kind of just got me hooked on the real, the simplicity of kind of just moving every day. You know, you're basically your, your, your tent is your, your home, your, your canoe is your office and your job is kind of moving forward through space. It's a very simple way to live and, it, and, it, and, and every day is different. You're seeing a new landscape every day. I've never repeated myself on any of my big journeys because there's, there's just so much to explore and see, not only in the world, but also, you know, in, in North America. And I think during this whole COVID time, we're very lucky we live in Canada because there is still endless, even with yeah. Nunavut being closed, there's endless amounts of uh, things to explore here. Yeah, you know? if there's any bright light to the dumpster fire that is 2020, yeah. it's that a lot of people have discovered or rediscovered the outdoors. It's I, true. I, I think yeah. Yeah. when you take a look at the the difficulty out, the outdoor stores are having keeping any kind of stock on their shelves. I think Mountain yeah. Equipment Co-op, which is the big local you know mecca yeah. for outdoor gear, I think a month ago, I don't think they had a single tent left anywhere on their shelves. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, MEC is a unique case because they're essentially no longer uh, because of very bad management. But um, I think every other outdoor retailer or manufacturer, like every bike shop, had like months and months of, yeah. of wait. Even where I was in Ontario recently, uh, my family cottage in Perry Sound, they had literally zero bikes in the Perry Sound bike shop. They had yeah. sold out completely. Um, and no one could anticipate that. And then, of course, they can't make more because the manufacturers are not even prepared to, you know, triple their volume all of a sudden, right? Yeah. So, um, but it, yeah, it's amazing. It's definitely people then look around and what, what can I do? in my backyard and here you can you can paddle on the ocean you can go mountain biking or hiking up the hill it's all right here which is a very lucky place that that we happen to live so yeah um, no, it, yeah it, we're insanely lucky and it's reflected in the real estate prices too i mean there's it's true yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you know, for the price of a condo here you could get one skookum mansion <laughs> in uh, i don't know the <laughs> suburbs of uh who, who am I gonna? Who am I gonna irritate? Uh, you could buy a great farmhouse in the middle of the Saskatchewan prairie. How's that? You could buy an entire town in Saskatchewan, I think, for a house here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So then you never had a. So your your metric then for testing people whether they're compatible or not is are they comfortable in the rough terrain yeah. of the mountains? Yeah. Because it's, it's kind of like not only comfortable in the in in the kind of the you know the coastal or interior mountains of BC, but also comfortable with you. You obviously yeah, have to have the personal sure. compatibility and and have uh, and have you know have an easy rapport with somebody and been through some stuff with them yeah. in kind of you know a, a, a not like a you know a kind of a I guess a quote unquote stressful outdoor situation, which is usually good stress. You know, you're very engaged during the moment. So people who kind of fly through in that sort of situation are, are always great people to do a journey with. Yeah. Well, it's a little bit like the advice that you, that I have anyway for people who are dating, right? Like, yeah. okay, great, you date, you have the early honeymoon period, then try and find ways to stress that relationship. Like going traveling is one way. If right. Going yeah. traveling and all of a sudden the other person loses their mind because, I don't know, you missed a train mm -hmm. and now you've got to spend the night on some train platform in some town in Italy until the other train comes at 3 right, o'clock right. in the morning. Yeah. If this is the end of the world, do you think that living together and having young children in the house <laughs> and having a mortgage or not yeah. and getting fired or not is going to be more or less stressful yeah. than missing some train? Yeah, yeah. In, I, I'm making that up. I, I missed a train no. in Italy once upon a time. Yeah, yeah. No, time. no, it's true. You have to kind of – it's always uh, the uh, – uh, uh, like say meeting someone on a on a Caribbean beach and having an amazing two or three weeks with that person on the beach, but then suddenly you you step on a plane and you land in Toronto in winter, and now what do you do, yeah. right? Now suddenly it's not that that kind of Caribbean beach that you kind of you know met each other on. So it's always that uh, you know putting people into into uh, difficulty and discomfort in a place that they don't necessarily want to be, but then having them fly through with a positive attitude, I think is, is almost the the best thing. You know, positive. You know, a solution-based attitude mm -hmm. to any kind of a, a journey like that. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions here. I, I want to talk about sort of the, the physical and then the financial thing because there's mm -hmm. a lot of people who. We'll start with the financial first. Yeah. There's a lot of people who have big dreams. Mm -hmm. And whether it's you know paddling, you know, multiple thousand kilometer mm -hmm. trips in a summer, or I don't know, uh, biking around the vineyards of France or or whatever it is. But they just don't know how to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So how do you pay for for these adventures? 
Yeah, so you know, I definitely live very, very simply. Um, it's definitely more of a, a lifestyle than a living, but it, it's my passion. And, and uh, through various means, like over the years, I've, uh, I've, I'm now like a regular feature writer for Explore Magazine, have been for a few years. I do a regular blog for them as well. Um, and I did a whole bunch of about six films uh, that I shot and then sold to the CBC Documentary Channel. So that brings in a, in a bit of money, but also also proves to um, both, you know, if you're if you're applying for a grant or or getting you know uh, gear or equipment from manufacturers, it shows that you're gonna you're gonna be able to kind of you know promote their products in a uh, you know in in a in an authentic kind of way. Basically, and then uh, and then just doing things very simply. Like I've never done a, ever done a journey where I require uh, my canoe to be dropped off by a bush plane somewhere. I usually I will just get um, get to either local town and then either get a, a drive to a, a drop in spot from someone. I'll pay them a couple hundred bucks uh, and gas to drop me off. Often someone in a local canoe club I'll contact. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, the trip this summer. Um, uh, Jimmy McDonald, well-known paddler in Saskatoon. Uh, he's also sponsored by Eskif, my canoe manufacturer, that, that has generously given me seven canoes over the years. So they'll ship a canoe to a community, to an address, and then I'll just have fly in like this $220 flight from Vancouver to Saskatoon. My partner came in from Ontario, you know, and we met in Saskatoon. And uh, Jimmy had the uh, the canoe and my paddles sent by my sponsors, Gray Owl and Skeef there. And we basically just loaded it up on Jimmy's truck. He drove us seven hours up to Sandy Bay, dropped us off. You know, I paid him for his uh, bit of money for his time and gas. And then we're off. And that's the journey. So in terms of logistics, kind of keeping it simple like that, instead of playing for like a $3,000 you know, plane drop. It's mm -hmm. very expensive now. It's become more and more exorbitant over the years to do plane drops. But you, if you, I think the main thing is to ha give yourself the time. If you're doing that sort of a journey, you're going to need more time, or just move pretty quickly. Like I always average. So if you have, if you have money, you don't have time, and if you have time, you don't have money. Exactly. Okay. But if you have time and you can look at doing it, you know, with a, a, a few grants or just out of your own, your own kind of like I. When I'm in a, a month-long journey, I will spend far less than I will if I'm here. You know, in in the city, um, uh, living a day to day kind of city life where you're, there's always you know expenses. It seems every day, out there everything is contained. You have your everything in, that you need in your canoe, and you're just off you go. That's it's a very simple way. And then and also for for flights out, often it is very expensive to fly out in these kind of smaller, you know, northern airlines out of places. But I've managed also through writing for writing for their in-flight magazines or to promote them in in a bigger magazine like explore or through my my films um i've gotten you know uh, flight vouchers and flight sponsorships a lot of the time from these often like two three thousand dollar flights you'll have to pay to get out of there so the flights up yeah. north are insane i, exactly, I took yeah, a, yeah. A, a regular flight from arviat to winnipeg and if if the plane had just taken off of it of arviat and landed in winnipeg it would have been like a 40 minute flight yes yeah Call it an hour, and I, I think it cost me two thousand dollars one way. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it took a bit longer because I had to go up to Rankin first. But yeah, it's but, also a bit of a milk run. So, yeah, yeah, but yeah. fair enough. But they didn't charge me any more for that. But still, two thousand dollars for basically an hour of flying. Mm -hmm. When there's lots, of, it's not a charter flight. You're not nope. chartering it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's like that. That really does take the wind out of a lot of people's sails. Yeah. And now you're talking some of the like really remote rivers, having like the Back River. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Like now you're talking. Big costs to fly. Yeah, and so maybe I, you've got some secret there. Maybe you're going to yeah, paddle yeah. the Northwest Passage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did. We did try to row the Northwest Passage actually from Inuvik. We we rowed eighteen hundred kilometers of it to Cambridge Bay, but then the ice never cleared around the corner. Uh, ironically, where where Franklin got stuck off King William Island, there uh, just never cleared for us that year. Um, and on that one, we had the 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 rowboat built here, and we just drove it up to Inuvik, and then had a uh, a friend of ours with us who drove the the canoe and the trailer all the way back, and then we were off and, and rowing um, on that journey. But um, the back river, I did I did that in 2018 from Yellowknife. We did Yellowknife uh, up to Chantry Inlet, uh, uh, so to the source of the back up to Chantry. Did it pretty quick, 35 days for an 1800 or 1800, 1750 kilometer trip, and then that was kind of just flying by the seat of our pants. We didn't even have a pickup planned. Really? Um, you're just nope. hoping your sat phone would last? No, nope. we, we actually changed our route because we were going to go up this river called the Kalit, which would then get us, and we were going to cross over to um, 
to uh, to to where Joe to Joe Haven basically uh, the 15k crossing, but then they, all the rivers feeding into the back of the river were super low, and so the Khalid would have been probably virtually dry. So we said let's just do the whole back, and and I just had with an inreach, just kind of kept in contact where uh, mm-hmm. when people were starting to come out, and so the ice. So an inreach being the GPS that yeah, can also have so, satellite texting. So with my my partner Shannon, she was just in contact with an outfitter there, seeing when the, usually when the ice goes, then the Inuit start to come down to Chantry to set up some camps and do some fishing and stuff like that. And I think just two days before we we uh, got to Chantry, the ice finally cleared in early August around Joe Haven, and then we just happened to find the only two little family camping there at this little waterfall. So we said there might be a, there might be people by the waterfall. What if your inreach yeah. had fallen in the water? Yeah, and there were no Inuit camp near there yeah. what was your backup plan then we had enough food i think to continue up all the way up up chantry and then work our way um up to um to a couple of bigger crossings and okay. just wait for weather windows um, but we did run into this family and they had a sat phone and i traded my canoe and a shotgun for a ride and accommodation in uh because the canoes i get i've gotten seven canoes fully sponsored by a skiff over the years and so yeah i just gave my canoe away and um, and uh, and then the shotgun away, and uh, and that was the barter, and that's how we got up to Joe Haven, and the flight was already covered, so I had okay. already organized with with First Air for our flights out for like a a visual promotional plug within the body of the magazine. So, Have you ever run out of food on a trip? Uh, no, no, been uh, I've gone really lean on trips before, just to cut weight. Uh, there's one one trip uh, we did. In terms of losing weight, um, I always lose 15 pounds every trip, guaranteed. Just with I'm, I'm, I've always averaged a minimum of 40 kilometers a day, no matter if you're going upstream, downstream. The overall average, if you're going long enough, it's always if you're doing putting in 10 hour consistent days, you can always do 40k a day average, often 40 to 50. And so I kind of budget on that kind of distance. Um, but uh, one trip, I, based, I decided to cut out lunches completely for my partner Taku and I. And just so we have, we can do all the portages in without doubling back, right? All the way across uh, between our, our food, our food uh, pickups in communities along the way. We basically paddled from Winnipeg uh, through way northern Ontario down the Albany, and then worked our way through Tomogamy all the way back to my family's cottage in Perry Sound. This video is on YouTube for yeah. people. Yeah, it's who... called Borealis. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and this originally and, you shot for the CBC documentary. Yeah, that channel. was my okay. first film I ever sh- sold to okay. CBC Doc Channel back in 2008. So right. um, yeah, but that one I basically took out lunches, and we both lost a lot of weight. Like uh, I dropped from 180 to 155 by day 50 of that when trip. When you say left out lunches, do you meant any food between breakfast and dinner? Just a, just as as my friend Taku said, it was just like a handful of snacks. So like maybe a couple of pepperoni sticks, um, mm-hmm. like half a power bar. And and uh, what else do we have in there? Uh, maybe a bit of, uh, a few squares of chocolate. <laughs> so we became like lean hunted animals, almost like you know, <laughs> wolves between their their main meals of breakfast. What which would, is what would breakfast and, be? Look, we're, we're on day twenty of a trip. Yeah. What's breakfast? What's dinner? Uh, three packs of oatmeal, and then some coffee is my breakfast, and dinner is just a pack of freeze dried food. And that, like a regular freeze-dried food meal. So when you say pack oatmeal, like those instant oatmeal yep. things? three of those. And then throw some raisins in there usually and then some coffee. And that's my breakfast. And then um, for uh, for dinner, it's just a, a standard like freeze-dried food pouch. That doesn't seem yeah. like enough calories. Like what's the, I'm trying to remember how much, how many calories in a freeze-dried pouch. Uh, I always make, I always go minimum 600 per bag. So it's usually like a... A really big meal is like a thousand calories in okay. those ones, eleven hundred. So, but yeah. then the oatmeal is that's yeah. only going to be like five hundred calories. Yeah, yeah, and then but, you, but but yeah, so that one anyway. So ta- I lost probably more weight than we wanted. Like we were basically like skin painted over bone and muscle by day fifty. But you know your, your stomach shrinks. The human body adapts. We we eat in our everyday life way too much food. Uh, you don't need that much to to have energy. People get so I never think about calories or calorie counts. I just think about how I feel, and I've never I was never low energy. I was thinking about food a lot on that trip, but I was just I was very I was just like a, a canoe tripping machine by day fifty. But but on day fifty we we stopped in a motel in, in Smooth Rock Falls and we saw ourselves in the mirror for the first time and we looked like <laughs> we looked like um, 
concentration uh, camp survivors. Yeah, concentration camp survivors, or like um, Christian Bale and the Machinist. Yeah, if you've yeah. ever seen that movie, um, this kind of just kind of oh, okay, maybe we should probably add a bit of lunch. You know, we're, we're on schedule here. And when I and I told Taku, because Taku, that was his actually first canoe trip. And he just accepted everything I said. Oh, said, no. I said, Taki, we don't eat lunch on canoe trips. He goes, oh, really? Okay. He just accepted it. He's, you know, he's Japanese. He's, he's got this stoic nature to him. And he just kind of, you know, tightened his belt and and that sort of thing. And, and uh, I mean, we would show up in these little First Nations communities to pick up our food parcels. And we, we could each eat like four of those 200 gram ice cream bars and just evaporate them yeah. into our bodies and it was just like nothing yeah. and so um i think you could definitely eat anything yeah. and uh and uh, burn it off yeah and, and i always go into the trips a bit heavy so i go in 180 and now and that one would drop down to 155 but now usually a lunch is going to be like tortillas with a bit of you know sausage and cheese or peanut butter and honey now mm-hmm. it's kind of a higher calorie lunch that i have popped in there um, that you can pick up in northern stores along the way if it happened to pass through communities. But uh, it's definitely, um, yeah, I'm always counting on losing. I usually lose a pound a day for the first 15 days of a trip, then I stabilize at 165. Yeah. And that's well, how my body works. So, yeah. A pound a day, so that would, that's half a kilo. A kilo is 8,000 calories. So you're basically burning something like 3,000 to 4,000 extra calories a yeah, day yeah. of your body. <laughs> do, do, so you try and go in there fat. Because I know that yeah. um, guys crossing Antarctica try and go in there like twenty pounds yeah. heavy. Because why drag the food in a st- in a sled? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then go through the energetic loss of eating it. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to get a hundred percent of those calories. Why not just yeah have it in your body to start with? Yeah, I think I think just on those trips because I'm not drinking beer, I'm going to lose fifteen pounds okay. no matter what. But, oh, so, uh, <laughs> so beer is your secret bulking mechanism? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So in the city, you know, I enjoy beer here and there, and and yeah, I think just. I don't. I don't intentionally try to go in, but my natural weight, you know, as I'm talking to you now, is probably about 180. Mm-hmm. And then, but uh, on on trip, you just kind of uh, be it a sea kayak or a, or a, or a paddling jer- or a canoe journey or a cycle or a ski journey. Um, I'm always dropping dropping down to 165. It seems to be my natural, you know, stressed body out, out there out there weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I suppose you do become more efficient. The thing I always worry about is uh, heat, right? Like mm. because you're you're burning, especially on a wet, cold day when you're churning, churning, churning. If you don't feed the body enough, mm-hmm. you're going to get cold. It's just so much yeah. easier to get hypothermia. Yeah, I think it depends on the person too. Some people just run hot, and mm-hmm. some people run a bit cooler. I run pretty pretty warm, I think, and and that's what these are for. You know, layers. Um, yeah. Arcteryx, one of my other supporters, local company, uh, but they, yeah, just having the right layers and uh, and right clothing to kind of, you know, you know, the the, the modern gear and equipment we have, we're, we're it's a luxury that we have that opportunity um, for sure. It's, a, so, it's astounding yeah. what yeah. the native people, the voyagers, and the explorers did with, you know, cotton clothing, mm-hmm. maybe leather clothing, yeah, yeah, and you know, no tarps, no Gore-Tex. No, yeah. nothing fancy. No, I we're mean, soft. We're soft yeah. today compared to people like, like what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything really unique. What I used to do, like every single waterway in Canada has been explored for thousands of years, just through First Nations people and Inuit people using them to kind of mm. find food yeah. and to and to travel their traditional routes and that sort of thing. And now we do it for really, you know, leisure and exploration and the passion to see new places. But uh, you know. People then they they did a lot more with a lot less than we do now. It's a, it, that's why even now and to be I, fair, I, I a bunch of them never came simple. back. Yep, yep, a lot of them, you know. They hey, no let's choice. go camp out on the Thelon for the winter. Yeah, exactly. And now yeah. there's a, a set of graves there. Yeah, and that's people again who are probably a bit naive in some ways in, in terms of how like I think John referring to Hornby there and and uh, and he was the naive think that there would be caribou coming through and they'd be have they kill a whole bunch of caribou and just be fine but you know migration routes change and they whereas this, and the native people yeah. would starve at intervals oh yeah too. For there sure. was this amazing yeah. and they had the same thing with yeah. with with like uh with again the, uh not getting enough food to last in the winter and sometimes yeah. it was that way so yeah there was an amazing documentary i want to say filmed in like 1920 or 1925 of the inuit of northern quebec hmm. and it was fake right it was these inuit who had rifles? Yeah, but for this, this guy came and filmed, and they pretended they didn't have rifles. Right. Yeah, and they would be living in the igloo, but it was a fake igloo. It was like a half open igloo because they didn't have lights. Right. So right. They'd be yeah. Living, pretending to live. Yeah. In this igloo, which they wouldn't have normally lived in, they right. probably went back to their cabin after that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's significant that a couple of years after they filmed that fake documentary, all a lot of those people in that movie died. Mm-hmm. 
because the caribou didn't come that year. So it, it's yeah, and I think that's just I mean that's ultimately the way. I mean I think people separate humans separate themselves from the rest of the animal kingdom, but that's what happens to any population that doesn't get you know has a disease go through them or doesn't get food. You know, it'll happen to a wolf pack; they'll die off as well. You know. And people, because they were dependent on the ecosystem completely, um, you know, obviously they would die some years, and that was natural. I mean, death is as natural as life. There's no, no one has a right to live a particular number of years. You know, it, it, it is what it is, and, and, and I think people, they were definitely harder then, and they accepted it more then too. People don't really accept, you know, uh, there's almost this kind of uh, uh, a self righteousness to I need to live till at least I'm 80, and and it's almost like this expectation that if you don't get to that age, that it's a tragedy. But it's just really, it's part of death is as much a part of life as as life itself, and that's the, that's the same with any organism on Earth. And I think we've lost a little touch with that, and people used to, you know, embrace death and 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 accept it more almost almost now almost than now for for, for uh it was all around them i mean now people them. now was, people yeah. die in hospitals then exactly. people died at home yeah people died at home they died you know they died young they died at all ages for various reasons they didn't have all the medicines and all the technology to keep people going like the, like we do now so of course now there is that, that expectation is that expectation has been built in now too mm -hmm. right so um, yeah, so we look at those people then as being super hard, but for them it was just normal, yes. you know. <laughs> Do you hunt or fish? Uh, I fish, yeah. And I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I carry a gun for for self defense in like polar bear country and stuff like that. But um, I don't on my travels. I don't depend on on subsistence living. I think mm. if you're stopping to fish and counting on fishing, you're not moving. Yeah. So if you have if you have enough food to get you to the end, then I'll supplement along the way. So I'll add. You know, we'll catch fish in, in the north on the back river. It's easy. You can pull, you know, three casts. You'll get three graylings or three lake trout, and you'll have, you know, fish tacos for the next two days if you keep it in a in a bag at the bottom of your canoe, right? Or you add it to your freeze-dried food to supplement as well. So it's something that is easy to get, but it's something I don't count on right. when I'm out there. And it depends. Even on the Seal River, which I found, I thought, oh, awesome, we're going to do – it's going to be some great fishing on the Seal River. The Seal River is the Seal River for a name for a reason. So we there are other fishermen, yes, or fisher and much more efficient people that efficient <laughs> fisher uh, creatures than we are. I remember we once stopped at this island. It was like the perfect big island. It was like a big eddies on either side. We were right at the tip, you know, eddy lines. It's like this is we're gonna we're gonna get a thousand fish here, and we're just fishing and fishing. We get nothing, and then we just all we saw were seals, of course, <laughs> popping up in the eddies on either side of us, and they'd clean the whole eddy out. And way before our lines could ever do anything. So, um, yeah, some wilderness rivers have other, you know, uh, predators on on them, like seals in this case, which go like 250k up the river, and uh, they can get them a lot easier than us. But usually in the northern rivers, you know, be it the Kazan or the or the Back or the Thelon uh, um, or the lakes up there, they're they're it's very easy to get get fish, mm -hmm. as you know too. So yeah. Other than getting skinny, how does your body hold up? on these trips like are you dealing with tendonitis or arthritis or any of the yeah. itis bursitis any of the itises it, yeah it depends. i think for for paddling trips it's always i, I, I haven't had problems it's uh, i think it's very low impact um if you're efficient from you know decades of doing it your body almost like clicks into into the right motion if you have a tweak you can adjust it um you can adjust the way you're holding your arms make sure you're using your big muscles and back you have proper technique and once you do it for a long time, it's almost like automatic. You step right back into it. You have this muscle memory. But I had to pull out actually on a trip uh, in twenty early 2019. Uh, myself and two others, we we um, were retracing the route. Um, basically, uh, John Ray was a famous Scottish explorer, and he was he was the first one to discover that uh, about the discover the demise of of the Franklin expedition. And so he basically went from uh, the north end of Hudson Bay um, all the way up to uh, to the Northwest Passage across from King William Island. And there he discovered the artifacts and remains and bones and stories from the Inuit of, of what had happened to the Franklin Expedition. So we actually retraced that route. But about uh, I had terrible foot problems on that and managing it by cutting my, my feet apart. There was swelling. I had big blood blisters on, on the balls of my feet. Is that from the portaging or going up river? We're, 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 this is a winter ski. This is like, oh, was, winter it, ski. Sorry, it was I, minus, minus I 50, 50 the first couple of days. Okay. Minus, minus, 
minus 30 was a warm day on that trip. We were kind of left uh, late March, early April, which is the time Ray did the trip as well. And uh, something basically triggered in my feet after a couple of days of, 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 uh, of tromping in these kind of more or less cross-country ski boots on, um, on glare ice and something in my feet triggered and it just never got better and they would swell and swell and I couldn't feel my toes. And so now when eventually, you know, trying to manage the boot, cut them apart and re sew them and trying to keep things going and managing the cold and all this sort of stuff and keeping the trip going and also f photographing and everything. And so, but at 18 days in the journey, I had to pull out once we got close to a, a, a town called Kugarik. And uh, I basically had to make the decision either another 200K risking my feet, which I couldn't feel anymore, and were just like black and blue and blistered. Um, and I was like crawling around on my hands and knees at camp at night. Um, so I basically had to, <laughs> you know, time. yeah, I, I, had to, I had to pull out on that trip. Luckily, those other two guys finished the trip, so the trip okay. was was uh, was completed. And uh, and oftentimes you learn uh, those kind of lessons are, are are valuable as well. Your body does fall apart, and you kind of you know you uh, it, it 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 puts the expedition into a different it frames it differently, but also makes often for although it's awful and painful it makes for a more interesting story when mm -hmm. you have these you know failures versus successes do you think you would have lost your toes and your feet if you'd continued? really it took me like a lot basically the nerves got killed by the the swelling and it took me i think two months to get feeling back in my feet again where i could feel my toes because that's the nerves that's gotten, not that's yeah. not too bad yeah i mean yeah so but i got everything back i didn't lose anything but i think had i pushed it any farther um, especially when it was an easy extraction where we were. And I basically was just kind of, for 18 days, I was managing and managing and managing, I was hoping it would stabilize. And then I knew when I got to that community, I'd have to make a decision if it did not, if no. it continued to get worse, and I did. So, yeah, so sometimes stuff happens and and you have to, you know, you know the consequences are what they are. But um, you, uh, yeah, in terms of paddling trips, like sea kayak and canoeing, I've never had an issue um, just because it's almost like a weight-supported activity. You're not on your feet most of the time, except for portaging, and you're um, you're kind of uh, yeah, you're kind of. It's a very smooth, rhythmic kind of action that you can adapt to as you go along mm -hmm. the way. So in that sense, paddling, I definitely is, is like kind of the the the, the low impact uh, part of it. I mean, I, I got pretty sore on the last trip because we did have some pretty bushwhacky portages to get from the Barrington into the source of the South Seal. And I have an old like knee injury that kind of flares up sometimes, but it, I knew I knew that would go away. I knew what was going on, yeah, and it wasn't like an issue. No. So it's just something. It's not to an manage. infection. Yeah. It's just and once you get back on the, on the water, then you know it's going to slowly subside. So which it did. Yeah. I'm guessing that my audience is yelling at me, going, "Why does he want to do this?" To me, <laughs> I, I, that's not really a question. Strangely, like right, right. Why wouldn't you want to do this? Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you get asked this all the time, so I got to ask it. Yeah. Why do you do these crazy things? Um, in terms of like, in terms of just the, the very base of it, it's a very, um, kind of like the, your, your day to day life, it becomes very, you know, almost like predictable and can be monotone. I mean, there's lots of amazing things you can do in your everyday life, but to put yourself into an expedition and all my expeditions, I, I don't try to retrace or, or follow most of the time. I, I kind of look at routes. If you look at my, my book's called Lines in a Map, because, because basically I'm trying to fill in all these wilderness lines on the map of North America um, by traveling through them self-propelled. And, and when, you're, when you're living day to day and every moment is new, every kind of paddle stroke is new, every, every, every bit of landscape is completely new to you, you're completely in the moment and engaged. You know, you're, you're right there. This is all, you know, new and fantastical. And you're dealing with, you know, uh, you know, difficulties that pop up along the way. So you're always perpetually engaged as you're kind of pushing through this route, whether you're running whitewater and reading rapids or dragging upstream or working a bushwhack portage, you know, you're, you're basically, you have to get to the other side. Um, you basically put yourself in a kind of a survival situation, but it's one where you, where I, I, uh, I feel very, you know, comfortable and to find that, that way of living, be it only for 30 or 60 days to live in the moment in that way for 30 or 60 days is, is the greatest pleasure that I know you're, you're, it's, um, it's always a little bit of a letdown coming off of a journey. The journey is never about getting to the end. The journey is that, you know, the, the joy of these journeys is the experience itself mm -hmm. as you're on them, right? When you get to the end, it's almost the end of, 
of the fun and you almost feel this almost sense of of loss you're suddenly you've been moving you know 10 hours a day and and uh you know looking for camp spots and running white water and and seeing all these amazing you know animals and having all these uh, amazing experiences with another person or, or or two other people um and then that suddenly stops and you're back in almost the the ease of civilization which is almost uh it's almost uh, a burden you know and so it's a, it's just that kind of simple way of living and discovery um and that's why i never go i always go to a new journey because i'm looking for that newness that immediateness of experience that you can't really find anywhere else it's a very addictive way to live hmm. for me and it's uh you know it's it's not not for everyone but i think uh even now you mentioned before people are discovering the outdoors and for people who've never been in the north shore mountains before i'm sure this summer people have discovered you know every day something new and something amazing and i've actually said wow i can't believe i haven't been doing this my whole life it's something that that kind of that that sense of discovery and exploration is is deep within all of us and that's what you know in nomadic times people would have been doing all the time that was that was normal life then and i think a lot of the almost the dissatisfaction and depression and issues with society it's almost like if you're being given something all the time and something is too easy and you don't, you don't have to work for it then uh naturally there's a depression because you're not you're not fulfilling what you're meant to be on earth for as far as being a human you know we are wired to move we are wired to to work hard and figure out how to survive every day and when that's taken away from you by technology and comfort it's it's something that i think leads to things like depression and that sort of thing so um yeah so that kind of that kind of two months a year is key for my own just mental health and engagement and just keeps me going you know year to year and then afterwards you bring back the creativity of writing and editing films around it and you have that whole creative aspect you can share your journey with other people and, and maybe they'll be inspired or interested in doing something like that themselves too not to that degree yeah. but to somewhat of that degree sure. yeah so just in wrapping up here what advice would you give to people who who've never done a longer wilderness expedition and by longer let's go two to three weeks sure sure yeah. they, they want to go to algonquin park mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they want to go into quetico the boundary waters area they want to paddle the the rio grande mm -hmm. they, they want to hike the appalachian trail what what advice could you give them if, if they're interested they've never done it maybe they spent a bit of time outdoors but they want to get into that two three weeks zone because i think it's very sure. different i think yeah. a, two days in the bush is great but really, I think there's like something that clicks over about five, six, seven days. I'd say, yeah, yeah. Usually, I say like about about two weeks in, you it starts nor yeah, being it, normal. It, yeah, exactly. Like so, it takes two weeks for my mind and my body to kind of break in, and once I'm in two weeks into a journey, then it's almost like I forget my old life, and my life is this this expedition, and that that's kind of that kind of you transition, and then you kind of really are. You know, a complete human being at, at that point, for myself at least. But in terms of someone else doing it and doing an expedition like this themselves, I think my it, just keep it very simple. You basically just need shelter, which is a tent, a mode of transportation, which could be a canoe or a kayak or a bike, um, and then you know some 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 sleeping gear. And then the main thing is, any of my expeditions, I just tell people you use the same equipment that you would for a weekend trip. If I'm going for a weekend trip in Algonquin, I have the same amount of equipment as I as I do for a month up in the north. All you're doing is figuring out how to, you know, carry more food or maybe pick up food along the way if there happens to be a community you can hit. So any any of these journeys is basically just a weekend trip with more food and you just keep on going. So you in don't terms take of, any more medical gear or any more repair no, gear? No, I have the same, same kind of repair kit, same same uh i mean on 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 day one or day two of a three-day you know weekend trip you could punch a hole in your canoe so either way you're going to have the the same amount of a basic repair stuff um to keep it going so yeah i, th I think yeah just keeping it com very simple just don't over complicate overthink don't think because you're going for 30 days you need so much more stuff 30 times more stuff yeah you don't <laughs> all you're all you're bringing is more food so as long as you have your food plan to cover your basic needs for the 30 days all the rest of the equipment is essentially the same so it's a pretty simple uh approach to doing it and then you know if you're if you're in going somewhere like algonquin or tomogamy where you can easily do a 30 day canoe trip or all those places it's pretty close by if you're like in toronto or these kind of you know bigger metropolitan areas it's very accessible and the planning maps are all there um yeah so just just figure out a way to do 
to either um, pick up food along the way or to carry more food with you. Sometimes you'll have to do more double back portages and stuff like that. You'll move a little slower. But um, as long as you keep moving forward, um, you're going to be fine. If you enjoy being in the outdoors, you're going to enjoy it even more for 30 days than you do for, for two or three. That's just your taste. Mm-hmm. And you get really into that real, you know, you know, Zen kind of uh, mindful state once you're a week or two in. Mm-hmm. And then you're kind of just in the rhythm, in the groove. And that's when you kind of really tap into to what, uh, what it is to be, you know, a true kind of expedition trimmer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think the margin of safety that's added by things like modern rain gear, mm-hmm. modern fleece, yeah, and things like uh, a Garmin, not so much for the map reading, but for the the SOS functions, right? Yeah, and the the basic text messaging through satellite, like that's something that all, all those old timers didn't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it does. Yeah. I mean, equipment matters, especially if you don't have great technique. But you know, it, like. You presumably had your had you been completely unable to continue at some point on one of your canoe trips, you would have hit the SOS button on your Garmin. Yeah. In, my, in the old days, it was in the ELT. PLB. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I never even used to carry a PLB. Uh, they were like a new thing, and they. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't didn't think about it. You know, just kind of PLB. Yeah. E L T yeah. and E Perb. <laughs> yeah, personal locator e- beacon PLB. Yeah. yeah, which you can still get, and they're 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 very simple. But like the inReach, like you said, like the Garmin. Like I do just almost as a fun thing because people follow my trips along. I'll do uh, a haiku a day, like a 575. And that haiku either captures a moment of the day or the essence of every day. And so if people follow us along, they can see where we are on the map and they'll get a little haiku to to kind of give them a taste of what the journey is. And and I've, ever since I did that trip with Taku in 2008, he he actually would write haiku in Japanese. He had like a a proper, like, um, like calligraphy, Japanese calligraphy book, and he'd write it in Japanese. And I, I started the practice of doing it, uh, the old 575 English haiku ever since then. And I, now I have like thousands of haikus from all my journeys since then, which once the inReach technology came out with the texting capability, it was the perfect medium to kind of share haikus. So that's kind of a something that that technology has kind of uh, allowed me to do too. I to love share my Garmin, well. but man, yeah. are they difficult to type on. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. I see what you say. It's the perfect yeah, uh, just medium. Do, you know, it's 160 characters a message. So the 575 is just straight and simple. And it's something you can think about during the day. It's mm. like, oh, what's my high? Oh, that, how do you do a haiku about that? Like, you know, I just saw, I just saw, you know, 10,000 caribou on the shoreline. There's my haiku. How do I mm. turn that into something impactful, but efficient in that mm. limited amount of space? It's almost like, like when you're on a canoe trip, even with a haiku, you're basically putting yourself into a box and this is all you have to work with. And when you only have that much to work with, you're not kind of like in everyday society, there's this something called the paradox of choice where you right. have too many choices. On trip, it's very simple. You're, you're going and you're moving forward through space and time with your canoe and a friend or by yourself. And the simplicity of the journey is what makes it really so joyful. Um, and, it, and it takes us out of this very complicated life. Right. I think probably when you're a soloist, that's why it takes you away from the noise. You can be by yourself with your thoughts. And it's a very simple way to live. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, um, that's another reason that um, uh, I love being out there. And I think most people, if they allow themselves to go there, they would enjoy it too. It's inside of us, right? So, yeah. I mean, you, you can do both, right? Mm-hmm. We're recording this mm-hmm. on microphones and yeah. cameras and we've got a brand new uh, audio recording device and we set this up through text messaging but on a trip it's paddling eating and sleeping it's it very simple and yeah. and that's that's really it and it, it it's such a joy to get back to that you very smoothly segued there into <laughs> when i'm on a trip people can read these haikus so <laughs> how do people read your haikus see your videos uh read your books like let people know. Yeah, my book. Uh, actually, I may have oh, brought a copy here. Even look at this product this placement. I, I am. I am doing. Here we go. Here's my. There it is. Lines on a map. That's my book. Um, yeah. Yep. I will hold it here. Yeah. <laughs> casually. <laughs> exactly. So that's available on Amazon in bookstores across Canada and North America. Um, makes a great Christmas. That one's got basically twenty. Four of my expeditions in there, uh, mostly pre-published work. It's got lots of maps, lots of photos. It kind of will take you inside, I guess, my my expedition experience in North America, Asia, and Europe. So a whole bunch of my journeys. Um, so that's available everywhere. If you want to check out some of my videos, it's just Frank Wolf uh, on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, I posted, but most of my my expedition films are up there now to view for free, including the recent polar bear interaction of a polar bear 
chewing on our canoe at the mouth of the Seal River, um, where Stefan has been before as well. And uh, I was in that yeah. same cabin, but there were and there were polar bear <laughs> footprints around it, and one of the walls had been caved in by right. a polar bear, <laughs> uh, but. There were no, we didn't see any bear on that trip. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, we saw 15 bears in two days around that cabin. Holy. I, I, I hear it's everywhere. the way the ice goes out. Mm -hmm. Like if some years when the ice goes out poorly, they all end up there. Yeah, yeah. And some years you, they don't. Uh, yeah, and, and also there. what happens to the Seal River is um, like there's about 3,000 belugas. Like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big you know, concentration of beluga there. And we saw hundreds out in the water there. And the tide goes out, as you know, so quickly there that you know five to seven kilometer long tidal flats that sometimes belugas will get hung up in the tidal flats and oh. the bears will go out and pick off the belugas they like, actually because there's so many belugas and the tide goes so quickly they'll actually regularly get hung up so the bears know there's going to be food there every few days and so okay. they're they're picking off these belugas um in that big kind of you know seal estuary hmm. so that's a reason that they're they're and they probably learned this maybe the word spread and there's more than ever <laughs> but um yeah we had three come in on us on that journey um my my friend she was taking a pee behind the cabin and uh, I, I just was kind of I was looking at them coming I said uh hey um hey Sean and she goes I'm taking a pee I said okay yeah no worries but there's three bears coming in really hot to the cabin right now maybe you want to consider coming in she quickly pulls up her pants we run inside the cabin and, and that's the one that started chewing on our canoe so they all have their own personalities that one was more aggressive than most but uh yeah really cool to see like an apex predator up close and mm -hmm. personal that's one of the reasons you do these journeys as well so yeah and your website uh it says fwolf.ca and that connects to everything the book mm -hmm. uh the videos all that mm -hmm. sort of thing too so okay yeah well hopefully uh some people will be following you on your next expedition which is what I'm not sure yet. I usually let myself give myself time and we, uh, to decompress. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the Ellesmere trip, which got pushed off last year, we were going to do a 400 kilometer ski trip that's forwarded to this year. But with COVID, I'm not confident that's going to happen yet. So, backup plan is probably to do a circumnavigation of Vancouver Island, kind of. A, and at, at that point, I'll have done the whole BC coast. I've already circumnavigated Haida Gwaii Archipelago. Did the inside passage this past year. So, if I knock off Vancouver Island, and the whole BC coast will have been seen with my eyes so that's the backup plan to Ellesmere if it doesn't work out if none of it doesn't open up in time so okay. yeah well I uh that sounds like an amazing adventure as well and uh, be out there with the sea lions and the uh the killer whales instead of the polar bears exactly so, exactly yeah, <laughs> predators all over the place that's right that's right yeah. thanks so much Frank thank you <laughs>